our reason of coming here, Lord, it was simply to give you our worship, to give you our praise, and most important, to sit and hear the word that you have for us today. So I pray even as I share for the next few minutes, that which you put in my heart concerning favor. May your spirit and may your blessings be with us, and may you give me utterance, give me the anointing I require, and give me the revelation of your word. Bless the hearer and bless the giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's look at Genesis 28 before you sit. Verse 30, 20 to verse 22. This is uh, Jacob in the Bible. And this is Jacob when he's running away from his brother. I will read it, then you will see it. It says in chapter 28, uh, Genesis, verse 20 to verse 22. It says, then Jacob made a vow saying, made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, I want to repeat that again. I trust you're with me. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, I will and, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. And he said, Then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you will give to me, I will give a full tithe to you. You may be seated in the presence of God. Amen. Thank you for praying for us while we were in Maledi. We had a powerful launch and a very, very powerful uh, dedication of the temple. Now, back to our scripture. This scripture speaks to us about just Jacob when he is fleeing away from his brother. I think for those who have been with us in the series of teachings we've had, we, we see Jacob running away from Esau, his brother, and he's uh, fleeing to a place called Haran. Just to be very br brief on this, I won't go into details for the sake of our time. And the man has reached a place where, just in the middle of the journey, and he encounters God at night in the, when he was sleeping. When he sees heaven open, and he sees a ladder from heaven, all the way from, from heaven up, up to the earth, and he sees men, uh, 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 some angels ascending and descending on that ladder. And on top of that ladder stands a man who I believe was the Lord Jesus. The Bible says the Lord stood at the top of that ladder. And the Lord began to give this man, Jacob, a promise. And he told him, Jacob, as you go to where you are going, I give you my promise that I will keep you there and I will return you to this place where you are actually running from. Now, after Jacob had had that encounter with, uh, with the angel, early in the morning, this man woke up, very early in the morning. After saying this must have been the house of God. Then the Bible says, and Jacob made a vow, made a vow. And in this vow, he said, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear. The man went further and he said, so that I come back again to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God, and this stone which I have set up as a pillar shall be God's house. Then he made a promise and he says, of all that you will give to me, I will give a full tenth to you. Now, my message, as I said, is favor acknowledges God as the giver of all things. Now, when the favor of God is upon you, and when God dispenses favor to you, that favor will always acknowledge God as the giver of all things. And I'm saying this because many times we have never, never known that God, sometimes when he blesses us, when the Lord has taken us back to the place where we have left or, 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 or the places or, or the, 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 the things that he has given to us, we fail to realize that God is the one who has actually given those things to us. Jacob made this vow to God at a place called Bethel on the way to Hiran. And I believe this vow was not just Jacob talking, just because uh, he, had met, he had had an encounter with God. It was not that. Jacob actually made this vow to acknowledge his full dependence on God as his provider. All of us know he was running away from his brother. And we also know from the Bible that this man, Jacob, was in trouble. He had lost his home, his life was in danger, and his brother had threatened that he would kill him after taking away the birthright of his brother Esau. So the man is going away. I mean, he's running away from his brother. His mother has told him, wherever you go, stay there until your father is dead. Stay there until your brother has been appeased of what you have done. 
Then we shall signal to you and you will come back. I believe this man didn't know what to expect where he was going. He was going to a place which he, he had never, never been through. I mean, he had never been before. All he knew was that uh, he was going to, the, to his uncle's place because Laban was actually as a brother to his mother, Rebecca. And the mother, I believe, understood that this man was going to stay in this place until the time when his brother has been appeased of what he had done. So Jacob, in that confusion, not understanding where he's going, is when he gets this encounter with this angel. And he quickly begins to think. In the morning, he wakes up, as I've said here. And he begins wondering, how will I be protected from the dangers which I'm facing? He was wondering, even as I go to that place, he didn't know the length of time that he was going to stay there. He didn't understand how, who was going to take care of him. The food he's going to eat, the clothing he's going to put on, probably the shelter. He had no idea how these things will work out. So the man decided, I will make a vow to God. And this vow was very simple. That vow was, if God, you will take care of me. If you will keep me where I am going and protect me. Give me food to eat. Give me clothing to put on. And then you return me back to this place where I am living. This man made a vow and he told God, I will make sure that I take a tenth of all that you have given to me and I will give it to you. Now, many times we don't understand what the meaning of the word vow is. The word vow simply means a solemn promise. It is a pledge or a personal commitment. When you make a vow, you are simply making a commitment. You are making a promise. You are making a pledge. A few months ago, we made some pledges here over the house that we are building in Kakamega for the Lord. And I came to discover when I was looking into my Bible that many times people make vows when they are in trouble. When you are in trouble is when, you, is when quickly you begin saying if, if, and if. The word if always comes, if somebody would do this for me, this is what I will do. And I can tell you on this pulpit here, we have prayed for so many people who have come here when they are in trouble and they have made vows before God. Even if it's not a verbal vow, in your heart you are saying to yourself, if God will take me through this situation or through this circumstance which I'm faced with, I will do number one or two or three things. So people generally make vows. They always make vows when they are always in trouble or when they are in need. They don't realize that vows are a very serious thing when you do. Because when you make a vow, you are making a promise. And you are making a pledge. And you are making a personal commitment. And it always happens, as I've said here, when people are in trouble. Jacob was obviously aware of his survival that was actually at stake. He knew where he was going. He was not very sure how things will turn out where he was going. He, he was not sure where he'll get the food that he's going to eat. The clothing that he's going to put, I mean, he's going to put on under shelter. So he made this vow to God so that he can be able to provoke God wherever he was going. To provoke God for his provision. Because, as I've said in the beginning here, favor will always acknowledge God as the giver of all things. You will always acknowledge God as the supplier or the giver of all things. When you go in the book of Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 4 to verse 10, and I want us to read that together. Because you will discover that favor always is an acknowledgement. I mean, a vow is always an acknowledgement. Chapter 3, verse 4 to verse 10, this is what the Bible says. Proverbs 3, 4 to 10. It says, so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Then it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. He says, in all things acknowledge him and he will Direct your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Then he says, honor the Lord with all your wealth and with the first fruits of your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. I want to come to my point. In making that vow, when he went to God in the morning and he says, Lord, if you will, if you will keep me. You know what this man was doing? This man was telling God, I am putting all my dependence on you. Even as I live and go to where I do not know, my faith and my dependence is actually in you. I can be able to trust you where I am going, that Lord, you will take care of me. That Lord, you will give me food. That Lord, you will clothe me. And that Lord, you will bring me back to this place where I am. 
And I want to tell you this. When you make a vow to God, you make God your debtor. Actually, if you come for prayer and you tell God, look, God, if you will heal my body, tomorrow I, I, I will give you this. Lord, if you will take care of my food, tomorrow I will do this to you. That vow that you are making to God makes God your debtor. I'm using that word, a debtor, because God will always fulfill his part. Are you getting what I'm talking about? He will always fulfill his part. So when Jacob was making this vow, he was telling God, although I am going to a land where I do not know, I am putting all my dependence into your hands. And I'm, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to believe in you. I'm going to put all my faith in you. And the Bible tells me here that if you put your trust in the Lord and do not lean on your own understanding, there are moments when things don't look good in the lives of many people. I have come to a point where sometimes I have gone through a situation where when I look into my life, I realize that unless the Lord himself was there for me, unless the Lord stood there for me, I would not be able to go, and I would not be able to go through that particular situation. And the Bible tells me here, when you, do, you put your trust and your faith in God, God will always, he will always make your paths straight. This Jacob man was running away from his brother. And we all know he was doing so because of the sin that he had committed. Taken away the birthright of his brother. Somehow the Lord's favor began coming upon this man. And somewhere along the way, the scripture tells me God began to honor this man. That's why he sent an angel with an open heaven and he said, I will be with you, I will keep you, and I will return you back to the place where you are living. This vow was simply a faith projection of his full dependence on God for his future. He was telling God, look, I can depend on you. I can depend on you. He was telling God, look, I will, even in this situation that I'm in, I am putting all my faith and my dependence on you. Then he told God, and if you will keep your part, even me, when I'm done with you, I will give you everything that you give to me, a tenth of everything that you give to me. And one thing which I want to tell you is this. When man vows a vow before God, when man makes a promise before God, when man makes actually a pledge before God, believe me, God will always honor that pledge by playing his part. He will honor that pledge by playing his part. Because there are moments when we come to God and we tell God, listen, God, you know, I'm going through this situation. Lord, if you help me and heal me, I will give you a tithe. Or if you heal me, I will be faithful in the house. People have come for prayer here. Saying, Lord, if you give me a wife, I'll be in church every Sunday. Some have come here for prayer. Lord, if you give me a job, I will make sure that I support in this area or that area. Lord, if you give me a job, I will be, I will be faithful in this way or in the other way. But the problem is this. Do you honor your vow when you have made that vow. Because I want to promise you, God will always honor his vow. He'll always honor his part of the vow. Because God cannot, and I can tell you, when you tell him something, he will always hear what you've said. And he will do his part on the part of his, in, in himself. But on your part, what do you do when your part comes? The Bible tells me, if you look in the scripture, in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, God is the giver of all things. Deuteronomy 8 and verse 18. The Bible says, you shall remember the Lord your God. For it is he, help me here, who does what? Who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant which he swore to your fathers even as it is today. Now, every one of us, whatever God has given to us, actually it is God who gives us the power to get to have the things that we have. For Jacob here, God was going to make sure that he gives him what he had actually vowed for him. The vow was if you will take care of me. And there was no way Jacob would go and stay with Laban for those years and leave Laban's place and come back to the place where he had left when he was empty-handed. And believe me, when you make a vow, God will always make sure you fulfill that vow. And he will do it by, and, by, by and, and ensuring that whatever it is that you must do to fulfill that vow has been done. Because the Bible tells me here, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he that gives you the power to make the wealth that you have, so that you can be able to establish his covenant, which he had sworn to his father Abraham. When Abraham was given, was leaving the land of uh, Hiran, God told Abraham, I'll make you a blessing. 
And he says, in you, the, the, the families of the earth will be blessed. To signify to me, even as Jacob was going, he was going as a descendant of Abraham. And there was no way God was going to keep away the promise which he had given to Abraham without fulfilling that promise in the life of this man, Isaac. So after God had given Isaac good success in that land, he caused this content to come upon the, the, the sons of uh, Laban. Remember, this man has left Isaac. Let me just go back a little bit here. And he's now in the land of Laban. And for 21 years, he's serving Laban. 14 years, 7 years for Rachel, 7 years for Leah. Another 4 years, close to 4 years, about 6 years, he is now serving Laban. And it's in the process of serving Laban that God transfers the wealth that Laban had in the last sermon that we, got, we were sharing here. And gives Jacob all those animals which actually Laban was trying to take away from him. And as soon as Jacob now has the wealth of Laban, the Bible tells me God now speaks to him and he tells him now arise, leave this place of Laban and go back to the place where you made your vow. If you got the book of Genesis chapter 31 and verse 3, this is now happening when, Laban, when Jacob has now received all the wealth that belonged to Laban. The Bible tells me he caused discontent among the sons of Laban towards him in order to provoke him to think twice about his continued stay in the land of Haran. The man was there comfortable in the land of Haran. Then God causes him to, you know, discontent between the sons of Laban and him. I think the sons of Laban began to imagine this man is taking away the wealth of our father. So they began to, you know, feel bad about him. And then the Bible tells me at that point in verse 31, chapter 3, the Lord said unto Jacob, return to the land of your fathers and to thy kindred and I will be with you. Remember the vow he had made. If you return me here, I will give you a tenth of everything that you've given to me. So what does God do? Now he begins to show Laban, I mean, I mean Jacob, what he had given to him. And this is found in Genesis chapter 31 from verse 11 to verse 13. 31, 11 to 13. The scripture tells me, then the angel of the Lord said to me, this is to, to, to Jacob in a dream. Jacob, I have said, uh, 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 no, and Jacob said, here I am, verse 11, I mean, uh, verse 12. And he said, lift up your eyes and see. He began to show him, all the goats that met with the flocks are stripped, spotted, and mottled, mottled. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. Then verse 13 says, for I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and made a vow to me. Now arise, go out from this land, and return to the land of your kindred. Now, this is happening when Jacob now has acquired all the wealth that Laban had. Those of us who read the Bible, you will agree with me. Laban tried to cheat him in many ways. But finally, God has taken what belonged to Laban he has given to him. The, the speckled animals, the spotted animals like we learned the other time. Somehow God has used supernatural way of making this man get all that to his side. That's when the angel now appears to him and tells him, now arise and go back to the place where you made the vow. Now, the key point which I want to bring to attention for just a few minutes here. God remembered the vow which Jacob had made. He remembered the vow which Jacob had made. To tell me, when you make a vow, God keeps that vow. Every time a man makes a vow before God, when you make a promise before God. I'm using the word vow here. Don't confuse with offering. Because some people think I'm talking about offering here. Anything when you, promise, when you tell God if you will do this for me. When you, you come to God in prayer on this altar. And you come with a, a vow in your heart. You say, Father, I'm coming to you. Heal me. And if you heal me, I will be faithful to you in this way and in that way. When you come here for prayer, you are be believing God for something in your life. You're telling God, if you bless me in this way, I will bless you in this way. Believe me, God will always honor your vow. He will always honor what you have said. He will make sure he plays his part to ensure that you fulfill your vow. But the question is this. After God has blessed you, what do you do? Because that's, that's the error that we have. The moment God has given us the things we have asked of him, how do we behave? So Jacob here, God reminded him. He told him, Jacob, I have now given you everything you needed. The angel walked him through. He says, see, look at these animals. You know, look at the camels. Look at the servants. Look at the wives I've given you. Look at the children I've given you. The things you asked me. 
you, you asked me if I take you and I take care of you. I have taken care of you for all these years. Now see. Then he tells him, now arise and go back to the place that it was from the beginning. But he did not only end there. If you look, he said, go to the place where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow unto me. Arise, get out, and go to that place. Because this vow, like I had earlier mentioned, was simply telling God, I can depend on you. And if I can depend on you, Lord, and you take care of me, and you bless me, I will use what you have given me to bless you also. So, so what God did to Jacob, he made sure that he gives to Jacob what would, what would be able to make him to honor the vow that he had made to him. To signify to me when I come to God with a vow, or, or when I come to God with a prayer that actually carries with it a promise, God will always honor that prayer. And he will give to you that which you are asking in that promise. The only thing is that will you go back to God and honor the, your part on the part of that prayer? That's the question. And that's what I'm trying to explain here. Favor will always acknowledge that God is the giver of all things. A man who is favored will not forget God when God blesses him. A woman who is favored will not forget God when God blesses her. Because listen to me, there, there is power when we honor our vows. There is power when you honor your vows. And there are three people in the Bible whom I have seen in scripture who made vows before God. And these men made vows when they were in trouble, just like Jacob here. They made vows when they were in need. I said many times vows are made when we are critically in need or when we are in trouble. When, when, when you are going through a situation, that's when you will come and tell God, God, Please, God, if you do A, B, C, D for me, I will do A, B, C, D for you. That, that is always the sense, I mean, in, in the case. And I see three men in the Bible who went through that. One man in Scripture who made a vow is a man called Jephthah. Jephthah. I don't know how many of you know Jephthah in the Scripture. Jephthah was going to war, going to fight an enemy. And the man went to God in that situation, looking at his inability, looking at the army he had, and he told God, listen, I'm going to this war and I know I can only depend on you for me to give you victory. He, he put all his dependence on God. He says, I can only trust you to make my path straight. Then he told God, if, you, if I win this battle, this is a vow I'm making for you, to you. If I win this battle and I return from this battle when I'm a victor, it's just for that speaking. He says, the first person who will meet me from my house, I will give this person as a sacrifice to you on the altar. Let me give an example. Pastor Mlema, I have a situation that I'm faced with. Then I come to church here and I say, Lord, if you take me through this situation, when I go back to my house, the first man, the first person whom I will meet, that person I will give to you as an offering. I don't know what Jephthah was thinking about. Maybe he thought because he was a king or he was a, he was a, a, a warrior, the first people he will meet on the way will be his servants. Or maybe somebody from his house who will walk out will be anybody. To tell you how serious vows are. I'm talking to, to men who make vows. Just a few months ago, we made some vows here. And sometimes you make a vow or a pledge or a promise and you take it lightly. Now, this man, after he had won that battle, because God always honors his part of the vow. And I will tell you, when you come for prayer and you make a vow, God will honor that part of your vow. He will do it. You will remain a debtor because God will never be a debtor. When I make a vow, I'm telling God, if you will, God will always honor his because he's not man. But you as a man, what do you do when he has honored his part? So this man, Jephthah, arrives home. And when he's arriving home, do you know who's the first person to meet him? As soon as he, he, he arrived home, his daughter left the house. And the first person he met was his daughter. And he had told God, whoever will be the first person I will meet when I'm arriving home. That person, I will sacrifice that person on the altar. I want you to imagine now, Jephthah has to take his own daughter and lay her on the altar and burn her. What do you think was going on in the heart of Jephthah? The scripture tells me he was very sick inside of him, but the man honored his vow. To signify to you, God will always play his part. But you as a person, how do you play your part? 
for Jacob here, God played his part. He made sure he gave Jacob protection where he had gone. Number two, he gave Jacob food where he had gone. He gave Jacob clothing where he had gone. And most important, he gave Jacob wealth to make sure that when he's returning back to the place where he had come from, he will go back to the place where he made his promise. And he will give him, he will be able to give back to God the vow that he had made. And I want to pray this morning that God will honor the vow that you have made before him. Because many times you don't see that. Sometimes we just come to God as though we are just going to a man. We never look at God the way he is. That's one man in scripture that I can, I can be able to cite. Another man in the scripture who made a vow is a man called Jonah. And you can find this in Jonah chapter 2 and verse 9. Jonah has refused to go and preach to Nineveh. And the Bible tells me God tells Jonah, takes a, 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 a fish and a fish swallows Jonah. We know the story. While he was in the stomach of the fish, Jonah began to pray. And Jonah prayed. After praying, he made a vow. He told God, if you spit me out of this fish, the mouth of the fish, I will preach like nobody. In other words, he was telling, jo he was telling God, if you spit me out, I will make sure I fulfill my vow that I've made to you and I will do it with excellence. And believe me, the fish went round and round, went to the shore and spitted Jonah right at the shore of Nineveh. Jonah began to preach. You know what I believe? Jonah preached like a very anointed evangelist. Within one day, Jonah had preached to the whole nation of, of Nineveh. I'm trying to imagine how God honored him by giving him such a special anointing that whenever Jonah was speaking the word of God, people were being moved in their hearts. And after he had finished preaching the gospel, the whole of Nineveh gave their life to Christ. So Jonah was spitted out because of the vow that he made to God. And God honored him by allowing Jonah to live again. So I can tell you, when you make a vow, you must honor that vow. Another man whom I see in the scripture, this was a woman. Her name was called Hannah, the mother of Samuel. This lady has been without a baby for many years. We know the story of Hannah. She's been mocked by others. People have looked at her as a, a nobody. She has tried all what she can, faithful in the church. Suddenly she stands in a corner, she tells God, God. And I think this scripture we can read together. She tells God in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 11. She says this, O Lord of hosts, if thou will indeed look on your, the affliction of your hands maiden, and remember me, and not forget your handmaiden, but will give unto your handmaiden a man child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. He was talking about Samuel. I want you to imagine this woman who has been without a child for many years. She's in her old age. Then she comes on the altar, and she makes a vow. She tells God, if you will give me a child, I'll give that child to you. And indeed, God honors his part. When you make a vow, God will honor his part. That's the point. So he honored the, his part. And he gave Hannah the baby we know as Samuel. Hannah keeps Samuel for a while. And after Samuel is just weaned out and is now a child, Hannah takes Samuel from her home. And she comes all the way to the temple. And she gives to Eli her child Samuel. I'm imagining if it was you, especially the sisters who are here. You've been without a baby for all the years. Then you get a beautiful, handsome young man or young boy. How many of you will drag the child to the pastor? And say, Pastor, keep that child. Then you go home and stay alone without a child. That's how serious vows can be. And I want to know that you need the church to know. There is power when you make a vow. There is power when you make a vow. I repeat again. It is not just giving. Like people say, today we have reduced our vows into things which are not in the Bible. Things which are not in the Bible. We have come into this question we call as the seed thing, eh? You've heard pastor saying, so as he did me. It's not in scripture. But let me tell you, vows are powerful than seeds. Because a vow, you have nothing, actually, when you are making a vow. When you are coming to God and you are sick in your body, I can't tell you, give an offering for you to be healed. The best that you can do, you come and tell God, heal my body. And when you heal me, and I begin working, I will bless you with this. That's how the vows work. Here, this man Jacob had nothing. But he was trusting God, putting his faith in God to believe God for provision. What we learned here the other time as providence. Where God will surround you and he will be with you and he'll help you. And he'll make sure that he gives you the needs that you, you have in your life. And when God begins to bless you with whatever you're asking him, then you come to him and you give it to him. 
That's how a vow works. And there is power when we make our vows. I will give you three things in just five minutes. Truths about the power of making vows. Quick, very quick ones. Number one, vows attract God's favor in times of need or in times of trouble. Now, instead of you sowing a seed, make a vow. Let me repeat again. Instead of you sowing a seed, do what? Make a vow. Because what a vow does is this. Vows will always deliver you in times of trouble. I will, I will, I will put it this way. I don't know which example I can use that is best. A few of them are flashing into my mind. But let me use this one. I need this one. You need a promotion. You've been stagnated for a long time. A long time, no promotion. Pastors will tell you, plant a seed. And many of us will be deceived by that. You take money, you go and give it to a pastor. A few shillings you give to the, you tell the pastor, pastor, listen, if I give you this money, pray for me to have my promotion. But I'm looking at it differently now here. I will come to God and say, Lord, for many years I've not had a promotion. If you give me a promotion, are you listening to me? If you give me a promotion, I will take my first salary and give it to you. What have I made God? A debtor. I've made God a debtor. And God has no, he, you cannot make God a debtor. You can't. God will always pay the debts. He is not a man that he should lie. When you make God a data, what God will do, after two months, God will give you promotion. Then he'll wait to see whether you can honor that vow or not. When the salary comes, it would have been very easy for you to have given a seed. But when the salary comes, and you look at it now, a promoted salary, what do you do with that salary? That's where now vows are tested. So when you do a vow, what I'm mentioning here, when you do a vow, what you are simply doing by doing a, a vow, you are attracting God's favor in time of need. This is exactly what this man did. Jacob understood he is going where he's going, he has nothing. He is going where he's going, he's not sure. But he tells God, if you will, if you will, if you will help me to reach there, if you will keep me, and if you will, then I will. Are you, getting, are you seeing it? So here you are attracting the favor of God. Because what is going to happen, God will always make sure he plays his part. He will make sure he heals your body. So that he can see, you came here saying, Lord, I am sick. But if you heal me, I will not miss any prayer meeting. That's about you have made. Then you are now healed on Tuesday, the prayer meeting is here. And your friend is inviting you for Nyamachoma. What do you do? Now that is where now your vow, you must fulfill your vow. The Bible says on this point, vows... Fair, uh, uh, attract God's favor in your life. Look at Psalm 66 and verse 13 to verse 14. It says this, Psalm 66, 13. I will go into thy house with burnt offerings. I will pay thee my vows. Verse 14. Which my lips have uttered and my mouth have spoken when I was where? In trouble. This is, this is a, a, David speaking. He's, he's telling us there, I will make sure that I honor my vows which my lips have uttered and my mouth has spoken when I was in trouble. It means when I was in trouble, I gave my, my vow to you. And that vow now has been honored by you. I will now make sure I honor, I come and pay back for that vow which I made. So vows attract God's favor in times of need or trouble. Number two, vows provide rights to God's providence. For your future. In other words, when the future knocks and you made a vow to God, believe me, you can now go to God and ask for that thing which you made a vow over. I will give an example again here. When we go to the bank to take money, do we go and take money which we have not put there? When you are sick in your body, and you go to Aga Khan Hospital, and they, are, and they take you to uh, they take you to whatever, whether ICU or whatever. You know, in your mind, the first thing you think of is bank. You will want to go to the bank and get some money for your treatment. Now, when you make a vow and you honor your vow, it prepares you. It act, you can actually call for you can actually call for providence in the future. There are people who don't understand 
that when we give to God, because the word vow here, as I said, is not only money. When you, give, when you make yourself available, you say, I'm offering myself to give myself to God. I'm offering myself to give my money to God. I'm offering myself to give my time to God. You are actually investing in your future. And when you're investing in your future, in times of trouble, you can go there and ask for God to bless you in times of trouble. A good example I always cite in scripture is, 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 is uh, Paul in the Bible. Paul was a preacher of the gospel. And there were churches which Paul had ministered to and brethren who really supported Paul when he was doing ministry. There are those who send money. There are so, those who send resources. There are so, those who send, you know, love gifts to Paul. And the Bible tells me in the book of Philippians, if you can cite, please, Philippians chapter 4. There was a gentleman called Pro, a, 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 a Prophetitus. This man was sent by the church of Philippi to go and bless Paul. So he went carrying money and some provisions and gave to Paul. Now Paul makes a statement and he says, when you brought me this money, it was in Thessalonia where he took the money. He says, for even in Thessalonia, you sent once and again unto my necessity. They were supporting Paul in ministry. And he says in verse 17, if you go to verse 17, not because I desired a gift. When people are giving, there are people who think they are giving to a man of God because he needs to be given. Maybe you are here in church, you are saying, I'm giving to Pastor Mlema. You, I don't need your money. It's, you're not giving to me. Paul says, it's not because I desired what? A gift. He says, but I desire, help me here, fruit that may abound to your account. To tell me, every one of us here, you have an account in heaven. You have an account in heaven. Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to make, build mansions for you. I know we don't think too much about that. You will be shocked when we get to heaven. There are people who will be in heaven with things which others will not have. Because many of us never understood the blessing of remembering our God. We never for, for, remember the blessing that favor, as I said, favor does what? Brings good success. And when you have favor, you will acknowledge God as the giver of those things that you have. Now here Paul is telling them, I did not take your offering because I wanted a gift. Like some people may think. He says, I desired a fruit that may abound on your account. Meaning that when you are now in need, you can now go back to that account and withdraw some money from that account. So when you, when you make a vow and you honor your vow, you've made a vow and you've honored your vow. One of the things you are doing, you are simply preparing yourself if for, you need to go to God in times of trouble, you can still go back and claim in times of trouble. And this, I can find this in the book of uh, Psalms chapter 50, verse 14 to verse 15. Let me just read this one. I make, I make the last point and I'm done. 50 verse 14 to verse 15. 14 to 15. Psalms, please. 50 verse 14 to verse 15. Vows provide rights to God's providence or protective care for your future. It says, offer to God sacrifices of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the most high. Then he says, and do what? And call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Meaning that when now my problems come, I can walk to God in the days of trouble and I can open my account, put my claim on the account on my account, and I will get what I need from God. That's why Paul, when he was writing to the Philippians, back to Philippians chapter 4 again, if you would very quickly, he says in Philippians chapter 4, when he had said that I did not want a gift, I wanted fruit will abound to account. If you go to chapter 4 again, Philippians, and verse 19, verse 19, Philippians 4, 19, if you could go there quickly, my good friends up there. 19, he says, but my God shall do what? Supply all your needs according to his riches, in glory by Christ Jesus. A scripture which many of us have misused. We, didn't, we don't realize this scripture is pegged on what the Philippians had done. It is pegged on the account of the Philippians, their givings, and their support and their vows. Then he says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory. Time will not allow me because I want us to have communion here quickly. The last thing, and this is the final one. Jacob's vow, the vow Jacob made, provided or established the law of tithing. The law of tithing. Tithing is not, was not a law given by Moses. No. 
like many of us think, it was not a law given by Moses. It is, this, it is this scripture where he says, I will give to you, that Jacob was establishing what we call ties today. Because Jacob became Israel. Israel were his children. And through Israel, the Bible says, God told Moses, tell Israel, every time the Lord blesses them, they will take a tenth of what they have, they have, they have been given and give it back to the Lord. Until a tithe was called the Lord's. The Lord's. And this thing has gone on until today. To signify that he was establishing what we call here the law of tithing. Which Abraham had already given. When Abraham won the battles with the kings that he was fighting. Melchizedek comes and gives him milk and he gives him honey and he gives him bread and he gives him some water. The Bible says Abraham took a tenth of all what he had and he gave it to Melchizedek. It was not an act of the law, it was an act of faith. To signify to me, even you as a believer, when God blesses you, give him a tithe. A tithe. It means that a tithe has now been established by oath or by vow. And this was established by Jacob when he made that promise to that angel or to God while he was on his way to Paradim. So in conclusion, God tells him, go back. And the reason for going back was because God had already given him all what he needed for him to go back to that place and fulfill the vow that he had made to God. Can I pray today that God will help us? Especially us who love Jesus. That the vows that we have made, whatever vow you have given to God, are you still with me? Whatever vow you've given to God, God will give you the ability for you to be able to honor that vow which you've given and take a vow serious. I'll stop at that. God bless you. Thank you for listening to me.